Hello and welcome to Theory in Crisis, a seminar series hosted by myself, Eugene Brennan. And today I've got the pleasure of introducing Professor Benjamin Noyce for a paper entitled The Crisis of the Future. One of the things I was hoping to do with this seminar series was offer a forum through which to consider key questions in contemporary critical theory in the context of ongoing crisis, but also in the context of various critical currents that have called into question and taken aim at critique for its parent, apparent outdatedness. A common charge leveled by theorists in these recent currents is that critical theory lingers on the level of detached abstraction rather than immersing itself in commodity society, a slightly perplexing characterization for anyone familiar with the canon in question. In this regard, Ben's work is particularly attentive to the entangled embedded position from which any critical work begins and must necessarily work through. And it's offered essential resources and analytical clarity regarding both the historical roles of theory and its mutations today. In contrast to some of the caricatures of critique that have gained currency, Ben's work is a model of patience and generosity in its thinking through the limitations of some of the new theoretical currents on their own terms. Reading Ben's engagement with accelerationisms, vitalisms, new materialisms, we find in his work not easy dismissals, but patient attentiveness to the attractiveness of such currents today, to what they're symptomatic of, and to insights into how contemporary critical theory could offer more convincing alternatives and responses to such developments. His 2009 book, The Persistence of the Negative, entailed an energetic rereading of key figures in contemporary continental theory, Deleuze, Derrida, Agamben, Negri, Badiou, and identified an affirmation its tendency among these thinkers, against which Ben attempted to reconstruct a thinking of negativity. Not necessarily a thinking of negativity based on Frankfurt School or familiar dialectical models, but one emerging out of a rethinking of contemporary crisis. Following on from this, Ben's next work, uh, Malign Velocities, retraced the series of historical scenes of accelerationism. A line of thought which, in many iterations, broadly argues that instead of rejecting or questioning uh, the tempos of contemporary capitalism, we should instead accelerate the process. As accelerationism gained currency in both left and right versions in the aftermath of 2008, Ben's critical engagement reconsidered key questions of subjectivity and labor that were essentially repressed by accelerationists. Ben has since published widely on topics encompassing psychoanalytical, political, and literary theory. As well as the books I mentioned, he's the author of Georges Bataille, A Critical Introduction, The Culture of Death, and editor of a collection of essays on communization theory. He's currently completing a book entitled The Matter of Language, Abstraction and Poetry for Siegel Press. And he's also working on a collection of essays, uh, Crisis and Criticism for Historical Materialism. Um, he's also editing with Alberto Toscano the three volume um, edition of Georges Bataille's post-war writings for critique. So it's my pleasure to introduce and hand you over to Ben Noyce for the crisis of the future. Thank you. Thank you, Eugene, uh, for that very kind introduction and um, for welcoming me to this seminar, which I have seen a couple of the earlier iterations, which are obviously available on YouTube. For those of you joining us who haven't, um, it's been an impressive series so far. So <laughs> try to live up uh, to that uh, impressive so far. Um, and yes, today I'm going to talk about the crisis of the future, which hopefully kind of bridges between some of the work that Eugene has talked about and some things I've been thinking about uh, lately and for the future. I would say that it's a complete paper, but it is also a, a kind of series of hypotheses or kind of experiment. So it could have gone badly wrong, of which we will see shortly. So it should take about 40 minutes, I hope maybe a little less to give us plenty of time for questions. So uh, please do ask me questions because I rather like that. So the crisis of the present moment, including the crisis of the present theoretical moment, is often understood as a crisis of the future. Mark Fisher, echoing Franco Bifo Berardi, proclaimed that we are experiencing the slow cancellation of the future. 
In Fisher's iteration of this crisis of the future, the cultural forms of high capitalism no longer display the dynamism and innovation he associates with, post, with punk and post-punk, but instead a retro obsession and static repetition of the past. In fact, Fisher argued the 21st century is perhaps best captured in the bad infinity of the animated GIF with its stuttering, frustrated temporality, its eerie sense of being caught in a time trap. There will be more to say about this diagnosis, its Nietzschean accents and the imagery of stagnation. Initially, however, I want to take it as a resonant expression of a sense of crisis that falls on our capacity to imagine or produce the future. The tension between the weaker version, imagine, and stronger version, produce or construct, is, I think, indicative of the crisis of capacity that runs through cultural and theoretical articulations in the present moment. Instead of this focus on the future, however, I want to suggest that our crisis is not one that falls on imagining or producing the future, but rather our inability to imagine or better map our present. So in contrast to that engagement with the present, I suggest that contemporary theoretical articulations are often divided between a utopian imagination of the future, inventing the future in the slogan of accelerationism, and those orientations that we suggest we turn to the negativity of a fundamental rift or wound in the deep past. The solution to the problem of the present is treated by a leap to the future or a return to the past. It would be easy if we could simply characterize this as a distinction between forward-looking and backward-looking, but I think that is too simple. It is also possible to combine both orientations. This is true of the work of Giorgio Agamben, which combines the well-known emphasis on ontological damage or wounding in the figure of bare life or life as absolute exposure, which has been there since the kind of beginning of the Western political order, with the less remarked utopian sense of a future life not subject to use or to the division between the human and the animal. It seems to me that utopian dimension of Agamben's thought is not always addressed. Agamben then is a useful figure in the division of his thinking, as Jessica White puts it, between catastrophe and redemption. In ger general, however, we can trace a split between different theorists in particular theoretical orientations. In queer theory between Lee Edelman's resolute destruction of the future in the name of a queer death drive and Jose Esteban Munoz's invocation of queer utopia. This tension could be rewritten between John Retsch's queer revolutionary romanticism and Leo Bassani's emphasis on fundamental fantasies of passivity. There is also the tension between articulations of Afrofuturism, more present in the 1990s but gaining interest today, and the contemporary focus of Afro-pessimism on ontological anti-blackness. Finally, we could also, perhaps with some forcing, contrast the relentless, relentless future orientation of accelerationism with the resolutely negative orientation found in certain forms of communization theory. Here, perhaps, the stronger opposition would be between accelerationism and certain forms of ecological thought, especially anti-civilization and primitivist currents. Now, in all these cases, there are complex articulations of past, present, and future that could be discovered in these texts and in these contrasting lines of thought. They are also obviously turning to the future and the past to address the present. This complexity does not, I argue, invalidate the point that the orientation to past and future risks abandoning the present. The splitting between a past primal wounding that provides a negative rupture and a utopian future that sends its tendrils into a destitute present, leave us living in the worst of all possible worlds. In Kim Stanley Robinson's Aurora, the science fiction novel of attempted space colonization, the mission is left as if, it were, as if we were flying through an absent present, a ghost world. In these orientations, however, this absent present is addressed as a moment of stagnation, degeneration or decadence, what Badiou calls an atonal world that lacks points of decision. In response, it's not difficult to cite again a much cited comment by Marx from the Grundrisse. It is as ridiculous to yearn for a return to an original fullness as it is to believe that with this present emptiness, history has come to a standstill. The bourgeois viewpoint has never advanced beyond this antithesis between itself and the romantic viewpoint 
and therefore the latter will accompany it as its legitimate antithesis up to its blessed end. If we currently exist in a present emptiness, one half of the bourgeois viewpoint, the alternative offered is an original or future fullness. While these theoretical currents I've just spoken about claim to transcend the antinomies of bourgeois thought, we might also be suspicious of such self-characterizations. Certainly the antinomy between original fullness and present standstill does seem to remain resonant, even if these terms are reworked by the currents I have sketched. So what I want to suggest is that this crisis of the future in theory, which I think also reflects a crisis for the future of theory itself, that's something I won't talk about but we could discuss in the questions, must be understood as a crisis of the present. Leaps to the ontological past and jumps to the utopian future are ways to avoid Hegel's hic rodus hic saltus, here is Rhodes, jump here, and his iris de rose ir tans, here is the rose, dance here. They also obviously ignore Marx's synthesis, hic rodus hic salta, here is Rhodes, dance here, these multiple different translations of the same phrase which make the same point which these statements do not say all we have is the present, but what they do say is that we must account for this present through historical reconstruction, hence the phenomenology of spirits or capital, these works of historical reconstruction, while also tracing the possibilities of the present as potentials to realize a future of self-determination and freedom, dance here, jump here. In each of these iterations of the phrase, it is implied that we have to grasp the present conditions as the site of overcoming. My point, therefore, is a simple one. Contemporary radical theoretical forms have embraced the future or the deep ontological past in a flight from the present. Images of stagnation and inertia remain to characterize the present of high capitalism in accents that are more Nietzschean than anything else. So what I want to do now really is um, analyze where this comes from, where this kind of sense of turning to the deep past or jumping to the future comes from, and then maybe turn to some alternative ways of thinking the present. So where does it come from? Uh, I would suggest that behind this division between the deep past and radical future and its various attempted syntheses lies the figure of Heidegger. And behind Heidegger, uh, the origin of this division is found in Nietzsche. So not surprising perhaps suspects if you like. This would make sense of the presence of Agamben as a contemporary figure who combines both orientations to the future and to the past, as his work is obviously heavily indebted to Heidegger. I'll come back to Agamben in a moment. Agamben is a kind of useful figure for me for kind of tracing some of the differences and modulations of these positions. So the Heidegger of the forgetting of being uh, is hopefully well known enough for me to give a quick summary this is the turn to the past. Western metaphysics begins for Heidegger with Socrates and Plato and begins by forgetting being and the forgetting of being therefore leads a fugitive role in the history of metaphysics. So for Heidegger, the history of Western thought is a history of the forgetting of being and it's kind of hidden appearance in various different names all the way down to Nietzsche's will to power. Um, so kind of being is always appearing, but in ways that uh, misunderstand it. To grasp being qua being, we need to return to the moment before this rift, before Socrates and Plato, and that is the moment of the pre-Socratics. So we have to go back to this deep past to rediscover being itself. This is a slight caricature, uh, and certainly we could um, talk a lot about Heidegger, but I think it's a worth, uh, still holds as a summary. Now, if this is the Heidegger of the past rift or wounding, in which what is forgotten is the ontological itself, then what about the future? Now, Heidegger might appear to be the most anti-future of philosophical thinkers, uh, simply seemingly condemning the global planetary dominance of technology as the final and most terminal end framing gestell of being a standing reserve. So Heidegger might seem to be the most anti-modernity, if you like, of all philosophers, contemporary philosophers. Uh, the turn in Heidegger's thought to the rustic and the pastoral, the images of the forest paths, the wisdom of the farmer, ancient bridges rather than modern hydroelectric dams, and so on, all quotes basically all there, 
uh, all roundly mocked by Alain Badiou, seem to give a kind of bucolic, uh, pastoral looking tone to Heidegger's thinking. Certainly this tone is dominant and it certainly remains present in certain ecological appreciations of Heidegger, but I think we should note that it, it lies alongside something or conceals the desire to embrace and traverse technology as the destiny of the West. For Heidegger, as the phrase goes, the only way out is through. Of course, part of the reason this element of Heidegger is not commented on so much is that it lies at the heart of his continued belief in the inner truth and greatness of Nazism, that's a quote from Heidegger, as the confrontation between humans and technology. Although predating the writings of the so-called turn, already in the 1930s and 1940s, Heidegger's vigorous defense of Nazism is one directed towards its capacity in his eyes to traverse the nihilism of technology. This is the special destiny he sees as given to the people of the middle, the Germans, caught in the metaphysical pincers of the United States, which represents capitalist modernity for Heidegger, and the Soviet Union, which represents leveling communism for Heidegger. Even in the late Heidegger of the poetic, the fourfold and reflections on technology, there is still an emphasis on the traversal through technology. This is why provocatively perhaps I have suggested that Heidegger might be seen as an accelerationist. While the accelerationists themselves lambast Heidegger as a reactionary who refuses to embrace technology, what we see in Heidegger, certainly not always clearly or evidently, is the desire for a new sort of making, a new relation of gods, mortals, earth and skies. I leave to one side how much this project would lie in continuity politically with Nazism or its variants, I think a lot, but that's for debate. But certainly the late Heidegger remains convinced, I think, that the imagination of the future lies through the devastation in his eyes technology has caused. Even the apocalyptic Only a God Can Save Us of the 1966 interview is still predicated on the rebirth or re-emergence of a god or gods out of and even through technology. Maybe there's things here we could say about his influence on Latour and kind of modern ideas that, are, you know, Heidegger's not so anti-techno science as you might think, one can be read differently. Heidegger's saving, which emerges out of maximum danger, suggests a vision of the future as a new kind of poetic making, a new dispensation of the earth, although one certainly marked by all the national and anti-Semitic fetishisms that are the persistent core of his thinking, like notebooks driven home. As I said, behind Heidegger is Nietzsche, and that's not surprising, considering the influence of Nietzsche on Heidegger. You know, that's, that's not uh, a surprise. But Nietzsche, of course, also makes a strong contrast between past catastrophe and future utopia, and the suggestion that the path to the future lies on traversing catastrophe to its extreme moment. Uh, certainly, Nietzsche's analysis of nihilism, discussed in the fragments collected as the will to power, implies a necessary working out or through of crisis. Nihilism, the collapse of meaning or into equivalence or inability to discern uh, between meanings, is the result of, for, for Nietzsche, the inquiry embarked upon by Socrates and the popularized moral questioning encouraged by Christianity. Basically, the questioning of values has led to their kind of collapse over 2000 years. These reactive currents for Nietzsche, uh, ironically so successful over the active powers of the elite and aristocrats, eventually have exhausted themselves by undermining their own basis. So the Socratic rationalism and Christian questioning have eventually kind of undermined their own moral basis for Nietzsche. And we can see how evidently similar this is to Heidegger's analysis of technology, which borrows so heavily from Ernst Jünger's use of Nietzsche to frame the dynamic of technology as mass disenchantment, if you like, technology realizes this mass kind of questioning, this mass disenchantment of the world. If the history of Western thought is for Nietzsche the history of an era of how the real world became a fable, then we have reached the moment of transvaluation in which this absolute disaster can be reversed into a new birth, new rebirth. People are already asking questions. <laughs> I'll wait till the end. Um, this is why Nietzsche is a philosophy for the future, as he announces in Beyond Good and Evil. The genealogy of morals telling the story of the catastrophe must be read alongside the passage to a reborn future in the world shaping powers of Nietzsche's new party of life. 
the affirmative powers of life are revealed out of the negative and life-denying crisis of Christian values and Western nihilism, again paraphrasing Nietzsche. In this way, as we've seen in Heidegger and even in contemporary currents seemingly distant from Nietzsche, we can see how catastrophe and redemption can be combined. Certainly in the birth of tragedy, Nietzsche is scathing towards what he calls the frivolous deification of the present and dismissive of the barbaric turmoil known as the present. The present is displaced by the relentless turn to the pre-Socratic past and the moment of the Dionysian tragic that is then the model for the rebirth of a new future in the form of a new tragic art. Well, this is the focus of the birth of tragedy, the structure of turning to the past and giving birth to the future is, I think, the general matrix of Nietzsche's thought, a past of hierarchical authority that throws a bridge to a future authoritarian rebirth of rank. So that's my, if you like, two villains. Um, but there is no doubt that some of the accents of past rift and future invention could also be claimed for or seen as present in the critical or Marxist tradition. It is not surprising, I think, that the Marxist influence on Giorgio Agamben would be Guy Debord, who is notably nostalgic for his recent past and who presents an early rift in class societies in the form of a history of separation. So in a sense, Agamben as this combining of Heidegger and Marx chooses a Marxist who kind of fits this semi-Heideggerian model. Debord's nostalgia is especially evident in his panegyric with its reflections on the decline of the taste of alcoholic drinks, the destruction of Paris by urbanism, and so on. Um, I think my favorite nostalgic moment in Guy Debord is the fact that people nowadays have to fill up their own cars with petrol and they can't rely on someone to do it for them. He seems to see that as a really bad sign for the bourgeoisie. Um, that's life. This obviously in, in Du Bois carried a critical and even a metaphysical charge in the sense of an emphasis on the transience of time as a condition of revolt. So, you know, there was a kind of critical point to this in Du Bois. I think these past nostalgias weren't just nostalgia, but it certainly could also carry the sense of melancholic loss that suggested an original fall. So it is, as people have done, possible to read this melancholy into, into Du Bois. It's also not surprising that Du Bois is paired by Gambon with Walter Benjamin, and not so much the Benjamin who embraces the liberatory possibilities of technology, what we could call the Brechtian Benjamin, uh, but the Benjamin of the messianic moment and the possibility of a healing of the rupture between humans and nature. That is to say, as I've suggested, Gambon fuses Heidegger with Marxism through Marxist thinkers who can conform to the model of rift or mourning. Even if both De Boer and Benjamin would give that rift an historicized form linked to the history of capitalist production. This then, I think, speaks to the crucial difference in that the rift in Marxism is not ontological or primary, but related to historical phenomena and notably the birth of capitalism. And the redemptive future is also not a project to be simply imagined or invented, but one to be traced out of the tendencies of the present. So the risk I'm identifying here is a fusion of Nietzschean themes, particularly an elitism, with Marxist ones of the necess necessary degeneration of capitalism. This is a risk evident throughout the 20th century rehabilitation of Nietzsche and the various left Nietzscheanisms that have resulted from that. And I'm probably sure you could find it in my own work as well. Uh, I think it's also a wider structure of feeling. One sign of Nietzsche's success for his project of aristocratic radicalism, dedicated to future free spirits, is how much it has infiltrated modes of thought that would vehemently deny any connection to Nietzsche or show horror at his thought as a coherent political whole. That is to say, a whole range of currents have come to accept elements of a Nietzschean vision of some kind of deep rift or failure in Western thought, and alongside that, or as an alternative, the creative need for the invention or production of the future. This is often done in the name of radical pluralism and creative investment in the powers of life, but without understanding the provenance and forms these take within Nietzsche and their implications, for which we can thank Domenico Lucerdo for outlining. I want to read his book. The cultural diagnosis of Mark Fisher that we cited, for example, is explicitly Nietzschean, and Fisher identifies with Nietzsche's aristocratic critique of culture. While Fisher identifies capitalism as Nietzschean slave morality, resentful leveling opposed to innovation, 
and identifies the working class with experimentation, the problem is, is this just inverts the structure of aristocratic critique, which remains in place. The present remains a stagnant present. While this Nietzschean critique is often given a radical accent or presented as a radical gesture, or even the most radical gesture, to use the title of Sadie Plant's book on the situationists, it comes at the cost of fundamentally losing the basis of a critical radicalism. So what is the alternative? That's what I now want to do. How then do we approach the present? If we are not to claim the present is simply destitute, atonal, mythless, or disenchanted, then we do also have to attend to the present as a problematic site. Certainly the exhaustion of the capitalist model by crisis and climate change, intensified in peculiar ways by the COVID-19 pandemic, which includes a moral exhaustion of capital, has not led to any major global resurgence of left or anti-systemic movements. This is not to discount existing resurgences, particularly in anti-racist struggles, but it is to suggest a weakness and disorientation in the present. In that sense, this is what a lot of the Nietzschean style diagnostics play on, in which a particular moment and form of exhaustion is laminated with a more global or civilizational model of crisis and collapse. That is not to say that capitalism as a civilization in Braudel's sense is not in crisis. In fact, the composition of capitalism as a totality, its global reach and intrusion into the depths of existence is what gives the crisis of capitalism the sense of a crisis of civilization. The totalizing effect of contemporary capitalism creates a situation in which the crisis of capitalism appears as the very crisis of civilization or life itself. This, I think, is what must be resisted, particularly by not overlaying capitalist crisis with a kind of crisis of nihilism of the type modeled by Nietzsche. This mystifies crisis into a crisis of value or civilization as such, and it also mystifies capitalism as a totality, which is not monolithic, but riven by contradiction and crisis. So this situation then is what accounts for my turn to an older work that has only recently been republished in English, Mario Tronti's Workers and Capital, originally published in Italian in 1966. It is a strange book to read now, dense, difficult, closely engaged with the text of Marx, and written in that high style of, quote, chiseled, lucid, and confrontational prose that Tronti sees as a signature of Italian operaismo, workerism. Sorry, I'm getting other messages. Uh, that distracted me. Uh, let me just close that. I could say a lot more about the book, but I want to turn to it for its discussion of class struggle. Tronti argued that capitalist development was driven by working class struggles. As the working class struggled against labor discipline and the violence of capitalist production, it forced capitalism to respond by developing new technological forms to replace workers or to minimize or mitigate their struggles. Hence, factories arose as tools of discipline and organization that aimed to subsume the worker to value production as a mere hand on the line. Uh, it's quite interesting if you look at the history of the factory, it's quite uneven and there's still a lot of kind of homeworking and things like that is taking place. It's a kind of uneven struggle. This discipline also has an ecological dimension as the regime of the factory shifted from sites of energy based on water to new concentrated centers reliant on carbon in the form of steam power. Thanks to the research of Andreas Malm in his book Fossil Capital, we know that the disciplining of nature was driven by the disciplining of labor, as capitalism's need for dependent labor required relocating to the sites of that labor cities. So in a sense, moving from water power to steam power was not the most efficient energy choice. In fact, at the time, water was more efficient, but it was the most efficient labor choice because you could move factories to cities and have a pool of um, proletarian labor accessible to you. I think his book is very interesting on that. The technological inventiveness attributed to capitalism is a result of its constantly having to displace and disperse working class struggle. In turn, however, working class struggles against the factory were also generated by the factory, which created a compact form of struggle that could explode at the point of production. And then in turn, capitalism was forced to new social and technological fixes, such as dispersing labor, relocating the factory form, further replacing workers by machinery and new forms of precarity where we are today, basically. 
In a twist on this argument, Tronti also argued that working class passivity and lack of struggle could have effects on capitalism. Discussing America in the 1920s, a decade of relative quiescence in terms of worker struggles, Tronti writes, working class struggles are an irreplaceable instrument of capital's own self-consciousness. Without them, it does not recognize its own adversary and thus does not know itself. Tronti even suggests that the crash of 1929 was in part a result of this lack of struggles, which robbed capitalists and capital of the ability and knowledge it gained from the struggle by workers. Without workers' struggles, no innovation, and no development and no knowledge. Tronti's argument implies that the ruling class gains its intelligence or capacity in response to working class struggle. This general intellect, to borrow and adapt Marx's phrase, is a result of the struggle and the intensity of struggle. Hence, we could say that the great inventiveness of bourgeois forms, say in the 1920s and the 1960s, is not unrelated to the great intensity of struggles in those periods. Therefore, I wish to make a speculative extension of the argument from an argument that is itself speculative. As Tronti admits, in a certain sense, lack of evidence is the evidence, as it's the lack of struggles that causes, in inverted commas, crisis. This is a veritable curious incident of the dog in nighttime, in which Sherlock Holmes deduces from the fact that the dog did not bark in the night, that the dog knew who was committing the crime. So the clue is a kind of absence or a negative um, here. It interestingly resonates as Zizek and others, as many others have pointed out with psychoanalysis, where you find the clues, is, clues are absences rather than presences. The curious incident here is the lack of struggle, and this peculiar lack and negativity is a symptom of capitalism. It will be this lack that induces capitalist crisis. Even after the crisis, according to Tronti, this lack of class struggle indicates the lucidity of the workers in the knowledge there is nothing to gain. So what I want to do then is extend this argument and suggest that this is why what Peter Osborne has acutely called high capitalism uh, and not late capitalism, as everyone says, late for what? Um, so high capitalism can appear so profoundly stupid. It is both difficult to resist and problematic to deploy metaphors of illness, problematic not least for those who suffer from those illnesses. So I will refuse that temptation and only say if class struggle is inquiet, intermittent and confused, our own ruling class is hardly less so. I don't also need to resort to proper names either. We can all fill in the blanks. This is not exactly a hopeful thesis, but I do think it outlines for me at least some of the pe peculiarities of the present. Not the least of which is the inability or the struggle to grasp historical temporality. A gap has appeared in time in which the 21st century is strangely amorphous and timeless. Guy Debord in his comments on the Society of the Spectacle noted that, quote, once the running of a state involves a permanent and massive shortage of historical knowledge, that state can no longer be led strategically. People of my parents' generation, who are in their 70s, uh, seem to imagine that they fought in World War II, which they did not. Script writers of film and television paint 30 years ago as if it were the 1950s and not the late 1980s or 1990s. My even more speculative thesis is that 1989 and the end of historically existing socialism ruptured time, not quite in the way Francis Fukuyama imagined, but in the sense of a caesura of time. This manifests in the occlusion of generations, including my own, strange combats across and within time that take on a phantasmatic form between generations, millennials and boomers, and repetitions and parodies that lack their own reference, thinking of the overload of vaporwave, the world's most proliferate musical genre. These effects are not simply cultural and not simply those of stagnation, but signs of a particular situation of struggle and resistance. Okay, I want to move towards my concluding remarks and start by noting that what I have said could seem very English or British. Uh, we could have a debate about both those words, having just completed the national census, which offers me a choice of both, and led my parents to argue with each other about which they were, um, but English or British, in the sense of very closely related to this context and overdetermined by the site of articulation. That's where I'm speaking to you from, south of England. <clears throat> 
Uh, of course, the cost of articulating something from this uh, peculiar capitalist heartland, uh, now seemingly we are the second oldest capitalist country in the world after Holland, now seems to be the new historian's favorite, uh, displacing us, uh, could also entail some benefits. Where once laboratory Italy became the phrase for Italy as a site of political experimentation in struggles, England or Britain may be a laboratory, I think, of particular and peculiar forms of reaction and also a history of resistance. I don't think we should be forgotten. It's also important in a related sense to stress that the passive struggles or the absent struggles I've been suggesting mark the present should not simply be enchanted into hope. They indicate struggle, certainly, but in an experience of weakness that makes them vulnerable to rearticulations and disruptive forms that do not align with our usual political compass. The right-wing strike, for example, has been a feature of struggle since at least Chile under Allende, but other such perversions in the sense of turnings are certainly present and possible. The strange incoherence or inconsistency we sometimes find in generations and uh, in protests and struggles at the present moment leading to the usual constant um, social media debates about their nature and form. Uh, Brexit, as I have previously discussed, uh, I've written an article recently on Brexit and accelerationism. Uh, Brexit, as I previously discussed, is a project for and of a future. And I think this is important to remember, just one I assume that we probably won't like, or maybe you do, I don't, don't it's up to you. Uh, it's a project certainly driven by Tory modernization. While Brexit is often portrayed as nostalgic and inward looking, uh, which is true to an extent, certainly, it is also aggressively post-imperial in the sense of wanting to continue an imperial self-image. Um, you know, as we might say, post-colonial continues the effects of colonialism and a continue, continuation of an orientation to a US style model. In this, it speaks to a desire for the modern and modernization that also drove many forms of accelerationism. So I'm, what I'm stressing here is something like Brexit is a project for the future, another project that tries to kind of leap into the future. This peculiarly English project to become even more so with the long predicted breakup of Britain seemingly on the cards is also another sign of the determination of the future from within a project of modernization, which has obsessed the English ruling class. One thing about the ruling class in Britain is obsessed with modernizing. Um, this is part of the appeal of Thatcherism, uh, which is quite interesting, really runs quite across quite many people. J.G. Ballard would be one fun example we could discuss um, of the appeal of Thatcherism. Its appeal, uh, Brexit's appeal, which is real, also forms around an incoherent inco resistance to experts and control, a desire to inhabit a destructive urge that is also self-destructive, rather than continue with the wearying repetitions of the present. In this sense, it forms part of this sense of passive struggles, perhaps self-destructive struggles. It motivates desires and passions that work within the forms of passive struggle. These passions, as I've said, I think are acutely post-imperial. And at best, we might hope that their excess could be a sign of their death throes. These difficulties are not new. The following remark from Benjamin Disraeli's novel, Sybil from 1845, quoted by Raymond Williams, might resonate today. The people she found was not that pure embodiment of unity of feeling, of interest and of purpose, which she had pictured in her abstractions. The people had enemies among the people, their own passions, which made them often sympathize, often combined with the privileged. While the data around voting in the last UK election which seems remarkably opaque to clear interpretation, we might still agree that at least some of the people did often sympathize, often combine with the privileged as a result of their passions. It is not wise or sensible to assume that the passive signs of class struggle I've tried to trace necessarily indicate a radicalism that remains to be tapped or organized into a new project. Raymond Williams noted, it does not come as news to anyone born into a poor family, which I was, that the poor are not beautiful, or that a number of them are lying, shiftless, and their own worst enemies. This, as Williams goes on to know, is itself part of the reason and demand for change. We are dealing with actual people under severe pressure. Williams noted also that this is not all there is to working class life. It is rather in such a life, the suffering and the giving of comfort, the common want and the common remedy, the open row and the open making up, 
are all part of the continuous life, which in good and bad makes for a whole attachment. These tensions, however, should not be forgotten and are core to a process of education, which is a mutual education, that I think might be able to address this absence of the present or the fractures of the present. It is easy to use the idealized proletariat as a way of dismissing the empirical working class or the malevolent forms of social abstraction as a way of saying we are all subjects of capital, which is true, but in such a way as to diminish the combined and uneven experience of that subjection. In these ways, however, class becomes a fairy tale, a floating abstraction of its own, one detached from experience and the struggles and possibilities that lie in that experience. Certainly, we can also see why we might want to flee into the future and images of a future dynamism if we adopt accelerationism. In everything, as uh, Eugene was kindly saying, I've said and written, I've tried to give due to the appeal of accelerationism, even if I regard that appeal as phantasmatic. There will be little point in exploring something once or as worthless. Yet, to reiterate, I regard this focus on the future as a way of occluding the present and aestheticizing that future. Similarly, and in parallel, we could say the same about a turn to the past. It's understandable why we might turn to where things went wrong. You know, Deleuze and Guattari famously say, you know, the obsession with when the Russian Revolution went wrong is kind of the source of many left debates, but we all kind of want to know where things went wrong and perhaps return to some state of original fullness. It's understandable desire. However, again, this kind of images uh, take us away from dealing with or imagining the future. And that's why I've suggested that we, uh, rather than inventing the future, uh, we uninvent the future to imagine the present. This is a return to questions and struggles and a return to collective work and education. First, I don't expect to provide all the answers. I hope I've sketched a series of problems, if you like, although trying to offer some solutions. And I think to work through the possibilities and impasses at the moment should be a collective work. Second, this is also a philosophical and intellectual matter. The endless demand for praxis or praxis is not wrong, but should not be at the expense of the intellectual demand as well. We have enough anti-intellectualism already, especially among intellectuals, not least what we could call the organic intellectuals of the ruling class. Uh, those media commentators and members of the ruling class themselves who have been the beneficiaries of a very profoundly um, expensive education. Uh, denouncing education as it is an offer to the working class or others. Also to ignore the intellectual is often to fail to respect the intellectuality of the working class and the need for a philosophical articulation that respects that intellect. That is why I have stressed here the sense of mutual education and I want to finish by echoing the point made by Marx in the thesis on Feuerbach, that it is essential to educate the educator. Thank you. Thanks so much, Ben. That was extremely no rich and capacious and gives us uh, a lot to think about over the next hour or so if people are ready to go for some questions. Um, just to remind everyone that you can enter questions and we'll um, get through as many as we can. Maybe as people are typing in questions and I see it's already kicking off, I'll just open up with them. Um, one or two remarks and maybe uh, throw out a first question for you if that's okay Ben. Yeah sure. Um, so one of the really interesting things about the talk I found was your use of uh, Tronti um, yeah. from Workers and Capital and maybe some will point a controversial usage as well um, but it kind of resonated with me with a point from the other part of the book where he speaks about um, how workers in a struggle don't really think about what comes after there's not a question of and what next for workers struggling against their bosses, the struggle is everything. Mm. And he kind of makes this point you were making about the kind of bourgeois assumptions of acceler accelerationist type theory to propose or technocratically um, engage in kind of um, pedagogical orientations towards the future. Mm. And in some of the contrasts you made then in the paper, you talked a little bit about um, kind of the evocation of the contrast between say accelerationism and communization where communization mm -hmm. would be more negative but i think there's also the question of um communization's preoccupation with the presence yes so the sense in which it's in you know it's based on the idea that revolution is not a kind of um 
orientation towards capitalism, but the act of production of, or sorry, not uh, orientation towards communism, but the act of production of communism in the presence. Now, in contrast from your work, I think um, those sort of theorizations of the present today tend to evacuate questions of politics or the political, or sometimes rush towards um, uh, dismissing kinds of mediations, you know, dismissing the problematic of transition and those sorts of questions. So I'd be interested maybe in asking when thinking about the presence in this way, um, how you think about the problematic of politics and the political as something that's sometimes thought about as, as being future oriented um, and that be, can be grappled with in this kind of context. And maybe as a kind of um, a jump off point, one of the, um, one of the questions uh, already published uh, builds on this a little bit. So if you don't mind, maybe I'll put a kind of a second set of considerations if it's not too much. Mm. Um, so Jack Frost writes about how um, the emphasis on the presence and present conditions is a sort of um, de facto orientation to history taken by Western Marxists in many periods. And she references communization too. Um, she makes reference to uh, also uh, mid 20th century Marxism and how Aragon and his metaphor of communism as a pair of magical glasses that allows us to see the present as it really is. Mm. Uh, but the question she puts forward is, if we privilege the present as a historical orientation, how do we avoid an unnuanced version of the present as transparent, immediate, and real, um, in quotation marks? How would a critical philosophy of the present avoid an aestheticization of the present as the unique portal to um, political truth? It's probably enough to take in for the moment. Um, yeah, okay, yeah. I'll have to just write some notes. Um, good question. Yes, the pandemic may not be doing very much to my thought processes, I will say now as an excuse. Um, yes, yeah, so first question that you asked, if I will probably now reinterpret it to something completely different to what you asked, because um, that's what people do. But yeah, I take it, communization, yeah, does use the phrase present moment quite a lot. Um, it's partly where I'm borrowing it from, you know, it's um, or present tense often uses. And I think uh, there's a whole kind of discussion we could have with the audience about, um, also thank you for people for clapping, it's the weird virtual silence. <laughs> uh, it's nice to see, I've been teaching a lot, which is even worse with the students not kind of responding. So it's nice to see some responses. Um, but yeah, in communization, there's a complex temporality of an emphasis on the present, but that's not simply like now. You know, that's the presence within struggle. So there's this, this kind of strange temporality in communization theory, whereby it's not simply saying, uh, you know, we have to struggle kind of now, in the sense that the kinds and forms of possibilities of struggle are shaped by the present moment, that themselves will initiate eventually a process of revolution that will take time. That's the kind of quite strange um, arguments you find within communization theory, or it took me quite a while, but still I struggle to grasp them, that it is not saying that we should leap to revolution now. It's almost like the possibilities of an immediacy of revolution are more present now because of the situation of the workers' identity in, in contemporary capitalism. But still, revolution itself would be a process. I think um, from friends who've been in the seminars, Roland Simon, who's the kind of leading theorist of communization, says it will like be 150 years of revolutionary process during which new diseases will reappear, old diseases will reappear, <laughs> rather like Mad Max scenario, um, which I kind of like. But the point there is, I think, coming back to your question, is I think what communization then struggles with is this question of what we could call class consciousness. You know, it is saying that the present historical conditions make communism possible in a way that it wasn't possible before, you know, in the sense that capital is a totality, the hollowing out of the worker's identity, the collapse of identifications based on the worker due to the loss of unions and uh, existing socialist regimes make possible a new kind of revolutionary identity that's kind of fully negative. But obviously that there's still a kind of element involving like how do people become aware or conscious of that? And if you look at some of the debates within communization, some people like take this very negative point of view, like it's just gonna happen because things are so bad and negative, it will kind of flip over. And 
including Brian and Simon, saying, no, it will involve class consciousness and propagating kind of knowledge and ideas. And I think that comes back to your point about politics. You know, there is, which and I kind of replaced that, I guess, with the notion of education. I've just thrown in a, a kind of replacement. I don't think we can simply say we are going to avoid those problems, problems that we classically associate with Leninism. And, you know, I think that's a problem kind of worth returning to, uh, getting more and more perhaps because the influence of some friends who are quite classical in their references. I think, you know, more and more classicist in terms of the Marxist tradition, that if you look at the history of Leninism, it's much more complicated than its dictatorial imagery might suggest, uh, including Lenin suggesting the need for cultural revolution, you know, within the, the what, what he regarded as the still capitalist Soviet state. Um, so I think, yes, those questions of politics and education and class consciousness are all kind of returning. I guess, just to finish on that one, I would like them to return within a kind of analysis of the potentials and possibilities of the present, not simply as I sometimes see it done in kind of thinkers like Laclau and Murph, where politics seems to be kind of completely detached as a floating signifier. It's like get the right signifiers and then you'll motivate people. You know, that seems to me to disconnect um, politics from the present. Uh, apologies, I can't remember who asked the second question, but yes, I, you know, the risk of aestheticizing the present is a very good point. You know, there's no, no reason to confine my uh, questioning of the future, you know, um, to saying like, well, couldn't you just end up aestheticizing the present as well, creating a kind of idealized image out of your analysis, if I've understood the question. Um, and I think, yes, that is a risk. Uh, I'm trying, I guess, which is what I'm indicating with the historical reconstruction uh, that is undergone in capital or in the phenomenology of spirit. And I think this also speaks to Eugene's question about consciousness. You know, I'm thinking of Gillian Rose's uh, interesting criticisms of Marx. You know, she has an interesting criticism of Marxism that it's not phenomenological in the Hegelian sense enough. It doesn't give an account of consciousness and the emergence of consciousness it needs if you like a phenomenology of spirit it has in capital a logic a science of logic if you like but it hasn't really got a full-blown um phenomenology you know Lukács' history and class consciousness i guess she would suggest would be close closest to it uh, and in a way she suggests that part of the problem of marxism is it reproduces those antinomies of bourgeois thought uh, I'm not sure, I'm nowhere near as wise and knowledgeable as Julian Rose was, certainly about Hegel. But I think that is something about you know, what we would need to do to avoid an aestheticization of the present and also to maybe have you know, a realistic imagination of the, of the future. I'm not saying like, let's not talk about the future at all. Uh, I'm concerned with imaginations or postulations about the future that are so detached from the present that they, you know, obscure. Um, muddle, confuse, you know, the, the kind of negative side of science fiction. And that's someone who is a science fiction fan. You know, I think science fiction, uh, to be very obvious, can clarify the stakes of the present, uh, but it can also obscure them as well. So it's not a kind of, um, I had this conversation before and I've given versions of this paper, I'm not calling for a ban on all discussions of the future, but I am calling, I guess, for a kind of interrogation that would connect past, present and future through particular kinds of um, analyses. And that would be my answer to those questions. Sorry, quite a high level of abstraction. I very much. No, that's really helpful. And um, thanks very much, Ben. Um, there's a lot of questions, so I better start going through oh, some of them. Yeah, I can answer um, quickly. If they... And maybe I'll go towards, uh, there's a few towards the end I might start with. Um, yeah from a, a shorter one from Ryan Nolan, who writes, uh, since you mentioned Osborne's characterization of high capitalism, I wonder if you have thoughts on his notion of contemporaneity, that the historical present is a disjunctive unity of co-present global times that isn't a singular time, but operates as if it is. Um, and then a, a, a second question then just underneath him from Daniel Tutz, who writes, hi Ben, I'd like to ask, for your reflections on the role of ressentiment in the contemporary passivity of the worker and how this might differ from Nietzsche's time when workers had far less passivity. Do we need to re-theorize uh, ressentiment or are we on the Marxist left abandon the concept? Cool. Yeah, um, on the first one, 
I have a lot to agree with with what Peter Osborne says. Um, for some reason, I don't always like the way he says things, but that's a personal response to the style of another person. Um, but I think there's a lot of sense in what he says um, and a lot of truth in what he says about something like contemporary contemporaneity. I think sometimes I find some of his formulations, you know, in the sense of kind of ramification and complexity, maybe neutralize political possibilities or leave me a bit puzzled as to then what what do we then do with that? And I'm not sure, I haven't read his book on art, so I've only kind of read the article in RP, so I don't always uh, personally kind of grasp the relationship uh, between what he's saying about contemporary, contemporary I can't even say it, uh, the contemporary, I'm going to say from now on, the contemporary and say artistic movements. And I think that is that tension. I mean, we've got capital as, if you like, as a unifying thing that draws together kind of different times within itself. And I'm personally, I think, Peter is also kind of reluctant to see, you just have to invoke an alternative kind of time. You know, you just need something like Bergsonian duration or you need, you know, Heidegger's kind of authentic time. We just need a kind of a full rich time that's not capitalist time. I'm a bit kind of skeptical of those sorts of arguments, um, of kind of turning to this outside, um, outside notion, but certainly I do, think we do need to look kind of look within the complexities and contradictions of experiences of time but coming back to the point with um, Eugene that's often involves processes of politicization because it's by no means obvious that uh, particular forms of resistance necessarily turn into kind of radical or um, you know globally radical uh, kinds of movements in fact often um, we end up with the situation that Furio Jay-Z the Italian thinker uh, finds in his book on the Spartacist insurrection, we end up with kind of insurrectionary moments which rupture the conventional time. And he kind of valorizes them. He's writing in the wake of 68, but he also points out that in puncturing bourgeois time, they somehow also often restore it. So they kind of, you know, he says the, the kind of Spartacists in a sense broke, ended the time of the First World War, which was this time of constant danger and warfare. This uprising broke that time, but then kind of restored us to kind of normal bourgeois time. And I think it's kind of interesting maybe to reflect on uh, certainly in the UK, but also in the US and other places, these sort of punctual interruptive events that we now seem to have of insurrection. But the problem of that then returning to kind of normal time, which is also often a return but marked by repression, you know, it's happened again in the UK in the recent um, riot slash insurrection slash protest in Bristol. You know, the police said pretty much they stepped back and then they're going to collect CCTV footage and just exemplarily prosecute people. So we have a kind of here, a kind of time of reaction where the uprising is almost allowed to take place and then kind of swept up afterwards. So I do think uh, within these kinds of questions of synchronization of time, um, we need to be attentive to those sorts of problems. That's quite empirical. <laughs> Uh, Daniel, was it Daniel's point about Rosantimon? I'm really interested in Rosantimon, um, partly because I'm an angry and vengeful person myself and uh, driven by rage um, at some fundamental level and see the power of bitterness, um, although also, of course, it's impotence as well in my own case. Uh, as I quote in Persistence of the Negative, Frederick Jameson says, resentiment is the primal class passion. Um, and I think it's very much true. I come from a working class background and it's very evident to see the anger that is generated by people who don't get what they deserve. Um, I think I'm quite clever. My parents are certainly as smart as I am. And my brother and sister are certainly as smart as I am and none of them went to university. Um, so, you know, you get effects of rage and anger driven, I'm not saying university is a magic answer to everyone's problems, not the case, but um, frustrations and resentments are certainly powerful drivers of class struggle and identity. At the same time, I think um, resentment is also a problematic category because it's being used by Nietzsche in a, an explicitly counter-revolutionary sense. You know, Nietzsche's argument is revolutions are resentment. Uh, it's, uh, sorry, I'll answer people's question. Uh, can I type messages here? Uh, sorry, I'm doing two things at once now. Furio Jay-Z is that author, the person asked. Uh, so 
you know, I think we need to rethink and rework the concept of ressentiment if we're going to use it to understand the passions that drive class struggle, which are often hatred and resentment and desire to level. You know, um, I'm going to maybe do a kind of launch thing about Domenico Lucerdo's book on Nietzsche with Harrison Plus, a friend of mine. And he suggested I talk about ressentiment, and I've kind of written a short paper about that. Um, so what I kind of say there, I think, is, you know, you kind of ressentiment is a crucial kind of part of the class project, but you need to detach it from its Nietzschean determinations. And in a sense, you could also go back to what Engels says in um, The Condition of the English Working Class in his book, 1845, is it? The book on the Manchester Working Class. We have some interesting remarks at the end of the book where he says, you know, the point about communist revolution is basically it will make sure the revolution is less violent. You know, he has quite an interesting appeal to the bourgeoisie. You should like communists because the communists will make sure we're not hanging you all from lampposts. Um, you know, the, working, the violence will still take place, but the communi communism is itself a kind of civilizing of the outbursts of class violence that you saw in the French Revolution with the September massacres or the, you know, a la lantern, um, hanging people from lampposts. So there's an interesting, again, kind of political or social problem of like, how do we transform or deal with ressentiment as a revolutionary passion? How would we engage that? And I think that's, um, you know, again, that's something that's interesting. If you contrast it with, say, Foucault, if you read Foucault's famous interview with the Maoists from the 1970s, where Foucault says, I'm all for the September massacres, <laughs> no, no mediation. You know, and they say, well, what about kind of courts of popular justice? Well, they're still forms of mediation. You know, like, at the time, kind of when I was more anarchist, great, sounds great. After a while, you start reflecting on it, maybe not so good. You know, hanging people randomly might not always be wise. So it's a kind of interesting problem that was confronted within the revolutionary process itself. You know, that's part of the argument for the terror in the French Revolution is that the terror was if you like, the Jacobins' response to how to organize this primal class ressentiment. Sorry, long-winded, but I'm really interested in ressentiment. <laughs> I think it's a fascinating topic. Thanks, Ben. Okay, I'm gonna put one more, one or two more questions now. Um, sure. Uh, Leah Kaplan asks, um, going back to the level of abstraction, can you possibly speak to duration or perhaps even a long durée, which would problematize a distinction between past, present and future, which is perhaps how Afro-pessimism departs from a clear retroactive project? I would argue that it evokes a notion of continuity that cannot account for these discrete divisions. Um, she comments later on that a good example of my question would be Haiti. Um, so a difficult question but um, maybe interesting in the context of Afro-pessimism as a contrast. And then I'll put one or two different questions as well. Um, sure. Uh, yeah. Nick Lawrence writes, um, thanks for a great talk, Ben. Following from the points concerning realism and the presence, could you say more about what the ecological dimension of capitalist crisis and present struggle implies, perhaps in response to Malm's points in progress of this story? moment only in the heat of this ongoing past um maybe those two are up for the moment yeah uh, sorry just writing down so i don't forget yeah um i have well like most things i've read some not enough afro-pessimism to do justice to it and i'm i kind of aware as i was writing a paper about you know about the other currents as well that i'm more sympathetic to afro pessimism than i maybe am to although also afro futurism than i am to accelerationism you know that it's easy to charge me with doing an injustice to their conceptions of uh, temporality and time um so i would you know say that that is uh, plausible and there are different kinds of conceptions obviously of afro pessimism it's not monolithic it's a it's a complex um kind of block of thought and internal criticisms and debates that are um, worthwhile. And obviously, you know, not surprised, I am white, so I'm not kind of super happy kind of commenting um, in 
critically um, without uh, being things to hand and being able to be kind of respectful of that. But I do think, yeah, certainly in the kind of process of Haiti as a state that has survived and persisted um, till the present and has undergone um, immense kind of violence and been subjected to still ongoing violence is an interesting example of uh, you know a political response and process to questions of ontological um, anti-blackness i mean i you know i would be honest and say i i am a little wary of kind of onto ontologizations of politics uh, in in general i know afro pessimism isn't kind of meaning exactly that but i sometimes find heideggerian notes slightly kind of jar with me within this relationship to temporality i know heideggerians themselves would say you know we're actually thinking time more fundamentally than you are uh, that would be their response but i do find that kind of um a sort of tension uh in it franco barchiesi as well has also done some interesting work connecting um questions around afro pessimism to kind of labor and worker struggles in South Africa, uh, which he's done quite an interesting kind of research on from a sort of autonomist point of view, where there are interesting issues of kind of um, anti-immigrant feeling within Africa and kind of debates about national citizenship there. So, um, sorry, that's a bit vague, but yes, I think there are kind of complex ways to connect past, present and future and in Afrofuturism as well. And in the critiques of them, you know, I think these are all Perhaps I can't give the impression of all more clearly debates um, going on, and it's in the debates that kind of interesting articulations um, take place. So uh, that's one answer to that. Yes, I think. But again, I suppose I'm also slightly coming back to the point I made to Eugene, kind of slightly wary about saying there is another kind of time out there which will resolve all our problems. You know, we just need duration. We just need an authentic time that very 20th century thing. I think it's Peter Osborne who has an article on time. He wrote a book on time. You know, he has that kind of table of like good time, bad time. And you can find it in virtually everyone and, uh, from, you know, including Luke Hatch and Deborah and people like that. And it's almost irresistible, but I still think somehow it's problematic. But that is something I struggle to think. Uh, the question about ecological crisis. Yes, uh, that's another really huge question that is very, uh, uh, good question that I'm not sure I've got an amazing answer off the top of my head to. I think there are interesting debates, I suppose, which I still don't think have been really settled about capital itself as an ecological regime in the contrast between um, sort of Jason Moore's long durational view of capital as ecological regime going back to um, 1492 and the colonization of the Americas versus Malm's kind of periodization of the carbon economy in the 19th century. I think it's I don't think we should just, what students like to do, can we just combine them? Um, I'm not sure we can just combine them. I think there are interesting kind of tensions and contradictions in our historical understanding of capital um, that maybe is part of the debate that becomes intensified by this ecological understanding. You know, how can we date, grasp and understand um, the mutations of capital? In terms of the present crisis, you know, I mean, it's certainly, you know, a, a massively shaping force on the present crisis, Personally, unfortunately, perhaps I see it as a shaping force in terms of the difficulty of hopelessness and kind of how to retain hope and how to kind of engage hope. You know, coming back to my point about the crisis of capital seeming to be a crisis of civilization or life itself, you could argue against me and say, you know, well, Ben, the ecological crisis capital has caused does prove that it is, in fact, a crisis of life itself because it threatens, um, you know, the, the bases of life on the planet. So I think at that dimension, you could uh, actually push back at me, people could push back at me and say, there, there is you know, a civilization at stake here. I suppose in response, I would say that's probably true, but as usual, these kinds of crises are going to fall on the poor and the weakest members of society first, and it's gonna be another combined and uneven apocalypse, you know, so to borrow Evan's book title, it's going to be a process that afflicts um, those people. I haven't read The Power of the Storm, though. I have read um, this recent book on Corona. Um, but that would be my answer there, that yes, ecological crisis would really give this kind of depth um, of the civilizational crisis to capital. 
Can I yeah, recommend okay. further reading on resentment? Yeah, uh, there's, there's some interesting remarks in Domenico Lucudo's book on resentment and Frederick Jameson's political unconscious is what I've nicked my ideas from. <laughs> <laughs> and I will be talking about that at some point in the future. So I'm just looking, I'm doing that thing where I'm talking and then looking at the chat. Um, so I'll put uh, two more questions here. Um, so the first one uh, towards the end of the chat from yeah. Hayley Ma Maxwell, yeah. who asks, can you say anything about activism oriented towards popular education by historicizing the past? Uh, thinking of monuments and museum collections, for example, in terms of kinds of engagements with the present you advocate for in your concluding remarks. And then maybe after that, we could go to um, uh, L. Hornsby, who says, um, hi, Ben, great paper as always. I just wondered how you might respond to Federico Campagna, following on from the, no, the Sex Pistols No Future, suggesting that we've come to the end of our future just as other worlds have emerged and then become ruins many times over history. And if you like this idea, then what lies do you think we might try to leave behind that others in this new world might discover in our ruins that could be useful to them? So a big question. Um, yeah, I'll leave you with those two for the moment. Cool. Uh, yeah, so Hayley's question is a good one. You know, I mean, I think these questions I've been posing are quite high levels of abstraction, but I do kind of, yeah, the question of praxis is an important one. What do we do on a day-to-day -day basis? How do we uh, live with ourselves? Um, and I would say that as someone who's not uh, confessionally, not like amazingly politically active. So again, kind of vulnerable to charges on that count. But I think, I don't know if I've got anything amazingly profound to say, but I think, you know, popular education, historicizing the past monuments and museum collections. You know, I guess I think it's always interesting to, for me, I've done more work around art and uh, so making, helping people around that. But I think in all these cases, it's interesting to think about where the financial resources come from, how people are, are possible to engage. You know, we've got um, funding is, you know, I mean, funding takes into account these kind of things, but, you know, there are interesting questions about engagement and debates uh, structured by kind of very basic questions about financial support and where money comes from and how people deal with that. I think I would, I guess I'm against um, this notion that, you know, we all live in, a, sorry, I haven't seen the joker, uh, you know, we all live in a society, we all live in a capitalist society and we're all engaged within capital and I think one of the things I like about Marxism is that it is important not to be kind of simplistically moralistic about that. You know, people are, we all have to earn a living uh, to self-reproduce unless you're independently wealthy. So I think, you know, asking critical questions involves a kind of recognition of, sort of basic kind of needs for self-reproduction. You know, I find this in people's kind of criticisms of like academics, you know, it's like academics are, we're the worst, the worst people in the world. Well, what job would you like me to do? You know, if you don't like me being an academic, please suggest a job for me that would somehow be so ethically, morally better than being an academic, because um, I do need to work, you know, that's, that's unfortunately, or well, fortunately, I quite like work. I'm one of those suckers, um, a given. So I think in the context of like those sorts of movements of popular education and historicizing the past and monuments, you know, thinking through questions of that, very basic things, sorry, you know, which you probably know, Haley. you know, I'm gonna, I guess I'm suggesting a thinking through a class, as part of this equation, you know, um, you know, these monuments are, you know, again, I suppose it's where debates about, you know, sort of around the student movement about abolishing the university. It always interested me in like, what about kind of repossessing that? Why would you want to abolish something that's had a lot of kind of resources invested in it? So, you know, again, with these sorts of things, you know, how they are, they involve resources that have been taken from people through colonial appropriation, as we well know, through, you know, the tape is like sugar, <laughs> uh, but also class appropriation. You know, these are literally materially appropriative things, which I don't think necessarily automatically means they should be destroyed, although in some cases they should, but also means we should consider about kind of reappropriations of them. So I guess that's quite a kind of classical answer, but an interesting one. The other kind of, I suppose, uh, I can't think of his name, but the anthropologist Michael Tausig, who writes about defacement, you know, defacement as an interesting kind of act. Uh, 
whereby when you deface something, it still remains, but you somehow you've kind of written over it or written or, or done something to it. And I think that's something interesting about acts of negation and negativity as something that's always on my mind. You know, to negate things is still, you know, to kind of preserve them. That's a kind of Hegelian point. So I guess in thinking about those things, how would we deal with that? Uh, sorry, I've now lost complete track of what the next question was. Um, it was the museums. There was another L Hornsby about Federico Campagna and Oh yes, yeah, Federico. Um, the Sex Pistols. <laughs> God, I hate the Sex Pistols. <laughs> Why? Why has my life involved discussing the sex business? Oh, sorry, no offense at all to the person who asked the question. It's just, I suppose it's this, I really, uh, it's kind of interesting to look at Mark stuff because he was the same age as me, um, Mark Fisher. Um, although we had an antagonistic relationship, it still makes me very sad, obviously, uh, what happened. So apologies. Um, but you know, punk as a kind of focus seems to me, this is not answering the question, but I just will have my mini rant about punk before answering the question. You know, punk, it seems to me, is not anywhere near as interesting as post-punk. And coming back to lots of the questions of temporality, one of the reasons of post-punk is so interesting is that post-punk exists before punk. If you count things like uh, Can, Faust, um, Silver Apples, um, you know, you have a capacious definition of post-punk. There's lots of movements that were going on kind of before punk that then kind of re-emerged through it. And also I think post-punk is interesting because it attempts to continue punk after its moment. So you have like the Sex Pistols and The Clash who produce their albums and are signed to major labels. And so they are, to me, the kind of classic model of like, we're radical and then we're recuperated while complaining about being recuperated. What I think is more interesting to me is the attempts by people to kind of think through that moment and work through it in post-punk, where they were like, well, we're going to have to try and make some money. We'll have to try and kind of, you know, make records and we're going to try and do that in this independent way. Uh, and I think that historical moment of being able to do that in that form has obviously passed. You can't simply reproduce that. But what I thought was interesting, which might also reflect on that museum question as well, was the attempt to be independent or to kind of negotiate or struggle within some of the constraints that they existed within. Federico's question, I guess, is, seems very Federico and we're in a dying civilization. What are we gonna leave? Uh, my own books, that's what we need to leave. Uh, such valuable documents for any future um, to find. Um, probably part of my narcissism does think that. Um, I don't, I, I, I suppose I find apocalyptic kind of things attractive and interesting. And I quite like Federico's work for its kind of provocative nature. But at the same time, I'm also profoundly skeptical. So we might be in a dying civilization. You know, we might be like uh, Rome in whatever it was when Rome fell. When the Romans leave Britain 144 AD, I don't know. I live in Chichester, which is a Roman, um, Roman city. Um, I was born in Essex, also quite Roman dominated. You know, we might be living the last days of the Roman Empire equivalent of the last days of capital, but I don't kind of think that apocalyptic imagination is a very useful way to think about what are we going to leave? You know, it's, I guess I think like, what are we going to do to help people now? How do we kind of survive coming back to the ecological question? How do we support people? Um, you know, rather than what do we leave? I guess what we leave hopefully is some memory of trying to <laughs> sounds very hippie now, to do kind of decent things, to try and kind of uh, maintain kind of critical ways of thinking, maintain, a, you know, if you like, a kind of ecology of struggles, maintain certain kind of decencies about belief in the world. I mean, to be honest, you know, this last year hasn't been great for that because I sit reporting to you from a country that's seen the death of around 160,000 people and seemingly very little effect on the moral hegemony of the current ruling class, which even I find quite shocking. You know, I find quite a shocking situation. Um, so, you know, yeah, so I think it's a, yeah, I mean, it would probably amount to the same thing. What would we leave behind? But, um, you know, I think what I would hope that we would leave behind is all of us trying collectively to do some of these things, to kind of keep some of these critical ways of thinking alive, to think through the stakes of what we do modes of care, you know, modes of 
life that are not attached to or not determined by the form of value those kind of things i think are what as a civilization we could leave behind i mean you know, I suppose part of the problem is, you know, it's that Benjaminian type thing. You know, most of what does get left behind and what you see is, you know, you know what it is. It's the, the art of the ruling class, you know, and it's amazing. You know, I'm, I like, you know, going to Italy and seeing art and you go into any kind of local church and it's like, oh, here's some amazing Renaissance art. That's like very impressive is what's left behind. So I'm not um, arguing that. But of course, at the same time, you are aware of also what's not uh, kind of been left behind. So. Um, Mark Meany asks, in mm -hmm. referencing Hegel and Marx, would you call for a reaffirmation of the importance of logic as a scientific method? And then there's a couple of questions accumulating on accelerationism. I won't go mm -hmm. through them all, but maybe I'll just put one or two together. Um, yeah, shall I answer that one and then we'll do acceleration? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah so thanks, Mark. Yeah. I mean. Um, amongst my many incapacities, uh, which I can blame on my poor education. Um, I did actually go to quite a bad school, um, as it happens. Uh, but yes, I wouldn't say I am a great, uh, a great ability at logic, either formal, classical, or um, in the sense that Hegel and Marx give it. But I do think uh, I am kind of, yeah, coming back to kind of ideas of um, logic and kind of scientific um, it's interesting you say method because obviously people like Julian Rose will dispute the very idea of method as a kind of separation from a kind of science. And I wonder whether that's also something that kind of Hegel and Marx are kind of interested in. One of the things I have been taught because I did social science is the philosophy of science. And I think I am interested in the, you know, attempts to reconstruct science as a form of rational belief, like you find in Imre Lakatosh, who's heavily influenced by Lukács. And yeah, I would say there is certainly a role for that not personally i don't like in the kind of blunt scientism that you get in the kind of new atheist type thing but um i thinking through of science i think is really something that we maybe lack because we seem to have kind of if we if i can identify with the left we seem to have lost uh you know some of the lost science as something that we did you know there's quite a lot of philosophy of science by left-wing thinkers christopher caldwell and people in the 30s but now um, now it seems to be everyone automatically identifies science and technology with the right. So perhaps that is something that I would like to see a kind of struggle against. And also myself, which I've written about five or six articles criticizing Bruno Latour. <laughs> now, as I joke, thereby proving his point that criticism is fruitless and negative. Um, you know, I do think there's also some need to kind of struggle uh, and criticize and also see what's valuable in those kind of critiques of science. I, for the new book, there is a, a chapter kind of doing the same with Donna Haraway. So, you know, I think a critical reconstruction of science is important. And also just on that, just to finish, I think there is an easy tendency to kind of pick the philosophy of science we like or to pick, you know, chaos theory suits us or the particular interpretation of quantum mechanics. You know, I think there is, um, you know, it's quite interesting to try and work out perhaps more complex interactions between science and other modes of thought that might not always be what we would like uh, in the answers. Accelerationism. Yeah, one of the comments on accelerationism takes up a slightly related point uh, mm -hmm. from Kyril uh, Potapov, uh, who asks, would you call what Pete Wolfendale, JP Caron and others are doing around using science and technology to separate it from the flows of capitalism, accelerating capitalism, Nietzschean or disconnected from the presence? Um, if so, is all Marxism that engages with science or pedagogy accelerationist? Well, I think you've already answered that a little bit. Uh, well, then just to punch in a few more, um, Moyer Top then asks, has COVID uh, de-accelerated accelerationism? Furthermore, I found affinity between your ideas and the writing of Ravi Sundaram and his book, Pirate Modernity, with the idea of kinetic overflows as accelerated zones or wild zones in the post-colonial space, which I think is interesting in implementing both your ideas, as you pointed to Devore and nostalgia of labor, the act of labor filling up cars for other people still occurs in India, South Africa and elsewhere. And then just to jump to one other um, 
uh, accelerationist question. It's towards the end, it's VREV. Inventing the future may also mean maximizing the space of reasons available at present, which is a kind of Salarsian invocation of the present's pragmatic rationalism. Would uninventing the future imply that this space of reason is suspect or somehow contributory to the present's lack of imagination? If so, would this lead us back to Heidegger's suspicion of the metaphysical subtext of all forms of rationality, leaving us with mere fatalism? Any thoughts on this? Thank you, Dave. Um, right, let me gather my thoughts. Um, so yeah, I mean, I can see some other comments on accelerationism. Um, How do I put this? You know, there are certain ways to kind of define accelerationism, which will make me or anyone an accelerationist. That's, you know, Mark Fisher says we are all accelerationists. You know, so there are certain kind of, if you define accelerationism in a particularly broad fashion. You know, I, I have a phone. I believe it calls people, um, then I can be accelerationist. I guess I think a lot of it turns out to be kind of debates about what is being accelerated and how it's being accelerated and what that kind of means. And I think that's where a lot of criticism and debate lies. And I mean, in fact, Eduardo Viras de Castro uh, and his partner, sorry, my name escapes me, um, who have written a very critical book, much more critical of accelerationism than I am, um, kind of say, you know, part of the problem with me is that I'm too sympathetic. <laughs> so, you know, I am shaped by a similar cultural formation to someone like Mark. You know, we listen to Detroit techno and things like that. So, you know, at some level, there are lots of debates about which accelerationism you're talking about. And I always try to be attentive to that. Uh, often I really anger accelerationists. I know that by not, but I do think I do. I try to be as intellectually honest as I can. Um, the person mentioning some of the recent work, I haven't, uh, I've seen it obviously because it comes up on my Facebook feed by J.L. Caron and this kind of the new, new, I mean, they might have been doing it for a while, this current contemporary generation or iteration around the new center. Um, I must, I simply haven't had time to follow it. I must admit that it might be age or it might be COVID, but my reading speed, which used to be quite frightening, is starting to slow down. Um, so I haven't kind of kept up with all that work, although it looks interesting. Some of the stuff about world making looks interesting. So no doubt there might be kind of commonalities there that I don't know about. Uh, the other question, which I guess if I might misinterpret what you're saying, but I guess you're kind of saying, you know, am I dismissing rationality, therefore ending up as a Heideggerian? I think my problem might be the kind of what you're talking about, about rationality defined in a sort of pragmatic way that um, some of the ways in which that particular mode of rationality is defined um, I find problematic in the sense that, that that kind of notion of reasons and rationality is for me um, kind of too Nietzschean and in fact doesn't give enough due to reason but I'm not a kind of expert on that I would defer to some of the critical work my friend Harrison Fluss does because he's more of a philosopher than I am. So I think there, there is a debate about what we're talking about when we're talking about reason and kind of types of reason. Um, so, you know, I would hope I don't end up as a Heideggerian, but it's, it's harder to not be a Heideggerian than you might think. I think it's quite interesting. It's my point about Nietzsche as well. You know, I guess um, if you read, you know, if you think about what Nietzsche is trying to do and you, you read Nietzsche and you read the Lacerdo book particularly, you know, Nietzsche says, I'm trying to kind of turn everyone into Nietzscheans. You know, I'm trying to kind of infiltrate my thought uh, into, you know, ev make everyone kind of like to do what I want. And this is the, the kind of grand ecocentrism of Nietzsche, you know, in Ecce Homo, you know, why I'm so clever, why I write such great books. Um, but there is something quite, you know, there is something quite clever in the way in which Nietzsche kind of does infiltrate his thought um and that thought is infiltrated through notions of difference and through things like that so you know i i bear a lot of that through my own self-formation through continental thought so it's quite easy i think probably to turn um that stuff around on me but i would say you know that's what i'm trying to kind of work through i guess at the present moment 
Um, the point about pirate modernity, I haven't read again that, but I will um, follow up the reference. Um, you know, as I sort of try to freely admit, I try to be honest again, you know, I'm writing from a particular and peculiar position of my own, which I hope um, you know, has some resonances, but um, I do try and kind of, I don't want to engage in a patronizing or dismissive way with uh, other global experiences because, you know, um, I think that can be problematic at the same time, I also don't want to ignore them either. But yes, I think um, the notion that there are other kinds of experiences in these sorts of sites and zones, I would need to kind of have a look at and think about and um, work on. But I have no doubt, you know, uh, from what the things I've read about, uh, you know, world ecology work on sort of petro societies in Nigeria and the kind of experiences of magical kind of realism as a genre that kind of approaches those experiences. Uh, the second world, the post-Soviet experiences and things like Tarkovsky. You know, I think these notions of zones, you know, I'm, I'm a William Burroughs fan. So, you know, these notions of interzones uh, and Burroughs' zones are, of course, uh, acutely um, colonial and post-colonial, if you think about its relationship to Tangier and problematic are, you know, kind of things, uh, sites that I think are important for thinking um, and working through and provide kind of, you know, and provide interesting situations where, you know, we have debates about apocalyptic situations and would they be revolutionary, but we can see apocalypses are happening all over the planet all the time. People are living the apocalypse. You know, that's, there's people, you know, that's a famous wage problem in Africa. You know, the wages are not enough to live on. People are living uh, on less than nothing. So I think that's also something interesting. We don't have to kind of sit through Mad Max Fury Road. Not my favorite film. Quite like Mad Max. <laughs> I don't know. I didn't like that particularly. Um, we don't have to sit through whatever apocalyptic film necessarily. You know, there are people out there experiencing that. Okay, thanks, Ben. I'm just going to read one or two comments to finish off. Um, yeah, no worries. Karina Lotz says, um, I agree with Benjamin's note that the present is mystified as non contradictory. Oh, Deborah Danowski, sorry. Yes, Deborah Danowski. That's Navarro's um, partner. Thank you. Sorry, Eugene. No worries, yeah. Um, I agree with Ben's note, the present is mystified as non contradictory by neo Nietzsche and neo Heidegger views. The nihilist view, which is diagnosed as so prevalent, leaves out the actual being and the intellectuality of the working class, as well as the reality experienced by millions of people left out of consideration. They are viewed merely as precarious objects, but not subjects of history. This leaves the ground open to reactionary and post-imperialist fantasies associated with Brexit. Um, and there's similarly one or two con uh, one or two comments about the contemporary and um, British context. Um, in that regard, I found it quite interesting your talk as well, the way you evoked the question of memory, uh, World War II, and, I mean, I feel like that's taken on quite psychedelic proportions in Britain in recent years. Um, yes, it's an interesting problem. Yeah, I mean, I think um, because it's happened sort of broadly in my lifetime, the kind of attempt to reforge an English identity and at the same time a British national identity. And I grew up um, in my born in 69. So uh, and my mother actually likes war films a lot. Um, so I grew up watching a lot of war films. Um, and it, although she doesn't, it seems to have kind of, it's almost like the media, you know, those big epic war films of the 60s and 70s where Eagles Dare, um, The Longest Day, um, some of Operation Market Garden, um, which I watched recently, you know, that whole, which end, that's sort of interesting, that sort of production of epic war films, I think it's The Longest Day, it's like 76, so they end about the time Star Wars then becomes the new kind of cycle of epics and you get the kind of sci-fi epic. And it seems to be like almost like watching those films, people seem to have become convinced that they actually fall uh, because of that. And I think also, you know, because of the war on terror, because of the reintroduction of kind of uh, military um, chic or, you know, the military into everyday life. I li literally live opposite a barracks, um, although they've actually turned it into a housing estate, very British um, kind of thing. Um, you know, all that has kind of shaped a particular imperial slash post-imperial imagination in contemporary Britain. Um, it's, 
Uh, it's quite interesting. I teach post-colonial literature, and if you read Patrick Brantlinger's book, you know about the 19th century, he says, you know, you know, the kind of imagination is always about the superiority of the English Navy and the English Army. This sort of national chauvinism is central to the imperialist project. Mm -hmm. And I say to the kids, well, you know, what about Andy McNabb and books about the SAS? You know, we're living a kind of mutated variant of this sort of national chauvinism focused on elite military units, focused on uh, you know, focused in this very precarious way now on these sort of privatized, you know, loan operative kind of versions. So rather than the kind of, uh, you, know, you know, mass collective identifications of uh, Napoleonic warfare or the squad level identifications that you get in kind of World War II films, now we're kind of being called on to identify with the sort of semi-private, semi-public agents. Um, I just watched for the 13 hours um, Michael Bay's kind of war film about Libya, um, which is all about private contractors. You know, the private contractors are all the heroes of this. So we're getting a kind of, um, yeah, a very strong uh, mutated history of uh, war as collective imagination. And of course, you know, that was a war that led to the foundation of the NHS as Beverly Silver points out, as a kind of paying off the working class. They didn't want a revolution like they had in 1917. Mm. But that's been turned into a very sort of chauvinistic national kind mm. of entity as well. So um, just when you thought England couldn't get any worse, <laughs> we live we live to make life miserable for people. Um, you know, it does seem to have kind of invented these new, new slightly floaty post-imperial identities yeah strange the reinvention of a kind of chauvinistic militarism seems to have gone hand in hand with uh targeted campaigns to make sure that you know soldiers in northern Ireland and elsewhere don't have to deal with human rights and um, accountability yeah. or oh, yeah. yeah yeah no i mean it's, it's, it's a reshaping of a political landscape mm. um you know that's really you know quite deliberate yeah the, the whole experience of ireland is, is has to be kind of reshaped introduced and redesigned to fit that narrative um, in as usual violent ways that's, mm. that's, that's the first colonial occupation I think it's interesting because in a sense I I part this is speculative again I imagine that I think English national identity was always quite thin because of our imperialism because we were an imperial country that had all these sort of dominions uh, you know, the world was a third red whatever that English national identity was a kind of weirdly global identity. And one of the things that the English and British always sort of pride, had pride about was like, you know, we don't bother about flags. You know, it's Europeans who have these civic ceremonies, it's Europeans who care, or, you know, other countries bang on about being countries and how important that is and their independence. You know, English national identity, I think, was actually its secret, its not so secret core was its imperialism. Mm. And that meant it had quite a thin definition. And I think as that has shrunk, it has had to be reinvented and you know, it's having to be thickened. You know, they're having to come up with a kind of thicker national identity. Mm. Um, and that's what they're doing. And it's interesting as uh, empirically, the architects of Brexit, the Tory politicians are often weren't born in Britain, but were born in South Africa, born in America, you know, they're born in the colonies. And mm. how, I mean, it's just, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Coming back to questions about resentment and class struggle, it's just when you realise the continuity of the English ruling class, mm. you have to be impressed in one sense um, and disappointed that 1649 was, as Lukács said, too early a revolution. Um, but you have to be impressed at the capacity and continuity. And as someone's saying, yeah, that's that's what the Labour Party have constantly struggled with, and now having a kind of national chauvinist moment themselves. Mm -hmm. Which they've always wanted to do blue labor and what do you think then about um the resurgence of this idea in certain corners of the left against blue labor or, or against any sort of patriotism for a kind of uh, regionalism like i'm thinking of the likes of alex niven's book on the end of england and seems to be various propositions of you know pushing towards the i don't know if regionalism would be a placement but some kind of uh localist politics that would kind of yeah um yeah, I like Alex a lot. Uh, I've never met him, I don't think, but I like his work. I find it interesting. 
and my partner's Welsh, so you know I have some sympathy with you know different parts of Britain. She always says, "I live in the south of Britain. It's so cold. You know, everyone's so miserable, and no one says hello." And in Wales, you know, you can't have a secret because everyone's talking to you every five minutes. Um, you know, we are notoriously uh, there's a kind of internal cliches of different parts of your country. Um, and different historical traditions, such as from South Wales, which was red, you know, um, but until well, it's slipping away now, but was always been red. Um, I think there are possible sources. I kind of interest me that we're kind of going back to debates that we had in the 80s, you know, where Tom Nairn, who was the original kind of thinker of the breakup of Britain, you know, he was saying, you know, what about, you know, his hope for the breakup of Britain was that Scotland would form a kind of, you know, a, a kind of balance. And he also kind of was quite pro-European integration to kind of have, you know, different socialist kind of nationalities, you know, to kind of encourage a pluralism to break up English nationalism. And so that's why I'm kind of thinking it seems like we're, which I'm not saying necessarily is negative, but we're replaying moves that people were already trying, you know, it's like we're getting more and more desperate. You know? <laughs> where is the alternative? You know, what, where is this difference um, as these and I think it's similar kind of experiences in France and other countries, you know, as these heartlands of the left mm. have been basically smashed to pieces, mm. you know, and left in a, a terrible state, which produces some of those, as I've talked about, some of those forms of passive struggle where people are left extremely bitter and resentful. And, you know, racism is a kind of response to that um, and fuels further division. So I, I can understand it. I kind of, have some sympathy at the level of hoping that would work out but i don't see any kind of significant movement within the british political system to make that a possibility mm. Mm. that could be hopeless but you know that's that's my mm. um, regionalism in the 90s yes um, tony wilson yeah what's that uh, 24 hour party people is actually a really good film um with steve coogan playing uh tony wilson i uh, yeah, metaphysics of the future leads into questions of reg regionalism. Yeah, perhaps. <laughs> Not sure if I would uh, be happy about that. What's the, um, so the Chester's and Napoleon of Notting Hill, where London breaks up into different competing kind of medieval boroughs all fighting each other. Um, I, you, know, I, you know, I think these things are, yeah, attempts to reimagine something outside of the kind of horror that is, or nightmare that is the present. You know, I can understand that. You know, everything that people have put hope in, in a way, um, seems to have failed, or at least seems to be in a pretty bad state. Um, so that, that I understand, and I think you know, that's that's one of the drivers from Alex's critical regionalism, Frederico Campana's more kind of anarchist, apocalyptic kind of imagination. Um, you know, Perry Anderson's kind of sober survey of why we're all screwed mm. in the New Left Review. Mm. Um, you know, Adam Curtis's bonkers uh, hyper normalization. Uh, you know, these are all, I guess, you know, going back to my point, uh, kind of attempts to kind of deal with that. I think, as you've done, you've done the seminar, you know. People like Alberto and uh, certainly Etienne Balibars for years, you know, Etienne Balibars has been the thinker of transition, as you pointed out in your introduction, transition as a mode of thinking temporality. And I think there's a lot, uh, you know, a lot to be said for that. Um, I think, I guess my own problem, not with Etienne, but my own problem is it's hard, I think, to stand back in this sort of sober way and do the analysis that some people do, you know. Mm -hmm. It's hard not to feel sad, unhappy, um, depressed or like, what do I do? I find it hard to hold on to um, that sense of distance uh, that some people manage to do. Oh, utterly depressing session. Thank you, Matthew. Uh, I'm not cynical. That's, that, that would be incorrect. <laughs> that would be very incorrect to think of me as cynical. Pessimism, uh, not cynicism. No, not even pessimism, I don't think, in a way. It's just, well, you know, I mean, there are plenty of forms of praxis. I, uh, you know, I'm just interested in kind of thinking about their possibilities as well as their problems. In fact, I've 
proposed a praxis of education, and I think that's uh, my answer to that. But I don't, so I don't know. Yeah. Anyway, posting rude comments in comments is a thing. Never read the comments, don't you say? Do you want to go for one final question, Ben? Yeah, cool. Okay. Yeah. Um, there's just one or two new ones came in. Um, so Conrad Hamilton asks one about the inverted Nietzscheanism of Fisher. And do you think Mark Fisher's inverted Nietzscheanism, his defense of proletarian and aristocratism, um, influenced his writings on uh, cancel culture in Vampire Castle? Um, I'm not sure if Fisher, if cancel culture was the term used at the time, but um, yeah. Yeah. Uh... I got. I wrote a piece on Mark that's quite, quite sympathetic, I think, uh, for mediations, and I'm going to be rewriting it, which may come out less sympathetically. I think. I think the problem is, I I think it, his thought is very Nietzschean, and that is a problem. Even though it, I've suggested it's trying to invert the terms, I still think it retains too many of the terms, um, and they're valent, so it just kind of reshifts around aristocratic critique. And it has a kind of really slightly strange um, kind of Sean Peter kind of vibe about um, you know innovation and the demand for innovation as being stifled by capital. It sort of seems to me to encourage a kind of entrepreneurial imaginary that I find problematic. Um, as for Vampire Castle as an essay, uh, I remember the trouble that essay caused. Um, my response isn't particularly measured. I think I had uh, some sympathy about the, the problem of class because like Mark come from a similar background, I think. Um, but at the same time, I thought the way it was articulated in uh, Vampire Castle was problematic. And I think partly problematic because of these Nietzschean accents. You know, it's trying to use the arguments about resentiment, um, you know, almost to kind of criticize the the cancel culture, you kind of criticize those sorts of modes. So it's kind of using the Nietzschean critique, you know, which Nietzschean critique says revolutionaries are driven by bitterness, resentment, and self-centeredness. Um, it's using those modes to, um, you know, analyze these kinds of cultural forms, saying, you know, the people who kind of uh, hate the vampire thing as well, um, you know, the vampires are, you know, these bitter self driven kind of people. So I, I felt that that Nietzschean type analysis wasn't a kind of sufficient analysis. I can understand it and I think it was, it wasn't the most resonant analysis, resonant characterization Marx ever done. Um, I can understand that. And I think there were, as they usually are, local kinds of issues driving that. Um, but yeah, that, I, I still think the inversion of Nietzscheanism is not enough to kind of escape it, I guess. I think it still retains too much of the Nietzschean crit critique. Okay, it's getting kind of light in the Friday evening, so maybe we'll leave it there. Um, yeah, that's no worries. Then. That was um, yes, thanks. for the paper, but that was really generous of your time and engagement with the questions. Um, just to briefly announce for upcoming sessions, there's three left. So we'll have uh, Sarah Salem on April 30th, uh, Abdul Malik Simone on the 19th of May, and Brenda Bander to finish off on 2nd of June. Um, so I, I linked to uh, the session with Sarah Salem in the chat. It's a session entitled Anti-Colonial Contradictions. And you should get updates about that if you're registered for the, the seminar series anyway. Um, okay, thanks everyone. And yeah, thanks again, Ben. Much appreciated. Yeah, thanks everyone for attending and thanks for all the questions and um, support and discussion. I really appreciate it. And everyone look after yourselves. It's difficult times that we live in.